Oye, Haribo. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay. Everybody here. Yes. What do you want? I received your voice message, but I can't hear anything, Maharaj. What do you mean you can't hear anything? Uh, you received. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. You can hear me? Yes, Maharaj. You can. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll begin now. Huh? Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha kaupa tarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhayevacha patita nam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're continuing our study of the Sri Ishopanishad at the level of Bhakti Shastri. This evening we're going to look at Mantra 2 and Mantra 3. Right? And you remember Mantra 1, right? You all remember Mantra 1? Do you remember? I hope so. Yes, Maharaj. Isavasyam idam sarvam yat kincha jagatyam jagat tena chak tena bunjata magrada kashataddhanam So everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should accept, therefore, only those things which are necessary for himself, which are set aside as part of his quota. One should not accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. So you will remember in the purport of Mantra 1, Prabhupada gave some examples about quotas, right? He gave the example about the lion. The lion has his quota. What is the quota for the lion? Yes, Yuvati Sachi. What's the quota for the line? Yes, right. Meat. That's right. Meat is a quota for the line. It's not the quota for human beings, but it's a quota for the lion. Right? And then he gave another example. What was the other example he gave? Who remembers? Yes, anybody? Quota was that we should take uh, Maharaj the cow. Maharaj the cow gives milk, but yes, Prabhu, thank you very much. That was the example. Very good. Yes, the cow. The cow. What's the, what's his quota? It doesn't take its own milk, it gives to it gives. And what does it eat? Grass. Right. Grass is the quota for the cow and it gives the milk. Mm, very nice. So two examples were given there. Okay. So that was the examples which uh, showed how people just... Yeah. It's an example how people just take what is their quota. So here, in Mantra 2 describes us the results. If you, if, you, if you do like that, if you just take what's your quota, 
What is the result? Mantra 2 describes. We'll read Mantra 2. Kurvaneva karmani jivishek chatam samaha evam tvai nanyate tosti na karma lipyate nare. One may aspire to live for hundreds of years if he continuously goes on working in that way. For that sort of, of work will not bind him to the law of karma. There is no alternative to this way for man. So this is a continuation from the first mantra. One may, you have to work in that way. What way is it? What, what was the point which was made in the previous mantra? In what manner we should work? Can you give one word? Sanskrit word? What's the Sanskrit word? That we should work in that manner? Maharaj Isavasya. Yes, right. Isavasya. And what's the translation? How does Prabhupada translate it? Well, the meaning of Isha. Control. Control. It controls by uh, God. God in the center. Right? Yeah. God centered. So if we work in that way, the Lord in the center, then we will not be bound by the law of karma. So that's something very beneficial for us. All right? So let's go into see what Prabhupada says in the purport. He said, no one wants to die. Everyone wants to live. They want to live as long as he can drag, <coughs> as long as he can drag on. And this tendency <coughs> is visible not only individually, but also collectively in the community, society, and nation. There is hard struggle for life by all kinds of living entities. And the Vedas say that this is quite natural. The living being the living being is eternal by nature, but due to his bondage and material existence, it has to change his body over and over. This progress, this process is called transmigration of the soul, or karma bandana, bondage by one's work. The living entity has to work for his livelihood, because that is the law of material nature. And if he does not act according to his prescribed duties, he transgresses the laws of nature and binds himself more and more to the cycle of birth and death in the many species, <coughs> in the many species of life. So Prabhupada is warning us. <laughs> We have to act, we have to do our duties. And if we don't follow the laws of nature, the laws of nature mean accept, accepting what is proper for us, being honest and living according to the laws of God. If these laws, if we don't follow the, the proper code set for people, then we, we become caught up in the wheel of birth and death. Karma bandana. Yagnata karmananra yatra loko yam karma bandana. In the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna uses this word karma bandana. Tadartam karma kontiya mukta sangha samacharam. Lord Krishna is saying in the Bhagavad Gita, work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise that work binds one to the material world. So you, we have to perform some kind of sacrifice for the, the pleasure of Lord Vishnu. Otherwise 
it's all karma bandana. Karma bandana means we are put in the wheel of birth and death, going through the different species of life. Oh, then Prabhupada continues the purport how other life forms are also subject to the cycle of birth and death. But when the living entity attains a human life, he gets a chance to get free from the chains of karma. Karma, akarma, and vikarma are very clearly described in Bhagavad Gita. So then Prabhupada discusses these three terms, explaining to us karma meanings acts according to the Vedas, acts according to the Vedas for sense gratification. Prabhupada said, action, uh, what he said, actions that are performed in terms of our prescribed duty, as mentioned in the scriptures, are called karma. Karma, we enjoy karma, but we also suffer karma according to how we work. When we perform our duty properly, then we get good karma. And when we don't perform properly, then we get <laughs> bad karma. There's also V karma. V karma is when we act against the scriptures. And then Akka. And then akarma is when you don't get any reaction. All right, actions which ha actions which free free one from the cycle of birth and death are akarma. So devotee wants to work on that level akarma. We want to get free of birth and death. We don't want to remain in the material world. So, this Sri Upanishad is describing to us, said, we can live for hundreds of years. <laughs> do, you, do you want to do that? Do you want to live for hundreds of years? That's not really the goal of life, of course. But some people like that. And material world, many people actually, they like to live. They want, they want a long life. And they think that's the goal of life. They don't know. Trees also live a long time. But Prabhupada said, what is the value of a long life like a tree? He says, Mahaprabhu was in this world only for 48 years. And Shankaracharya was in this world only 32 years. But they made great contributions to the world. So he, Prabhupada says, better a moment of full consciousness than a lifetime like the tree. All right, we'll go ahead. The instructions of Sri Ishopanishad are more elaborately explained in the Bhagavad Gita. So actually the same teachings are there. Bhagavad Gita, Sri Shopanishad. Sri Shopanishad is give, giving us a glimpse of devotional service. It's much clearer in the Bhagavad Gita because Bhagavad Gita is directly Lord Krishna's words. The Ishopanishad, it's uh, the stepping stones to devotional service. It's, it's not that we can so easily understand Krishna from the Ishopanishad. But with the help of a devotee, then it becomes easy. So Srila Prabhupada explains in the Bhagavad Gita, third chapter, Krishna says that one cannot attain the stage of nice karmya, which means the same as akarma, means get, getting free of birth and death. So you cannot ex come to that level without executing the prescribed duties mentioned in the Vedas. This literature can regulate the working energy in such a way that he can gradually realize 
the authority of the Supreme Being. And when he realizes the authority of Krishna, then he understands that he has attained, it is understood that he has attained the stage of positive knowledge. In this purified stage, the modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance cannot act, and he is able to work on the basis of nice karmya. Such work does not bind one to the cycle of birth and death. So Prabhupada's explaining, if you can get free of the, the modes of nature, if you can come up to the transcendental level, no more influence of the modes of nature, then you can get, free, you can, this is the level of nice karmya. And you can get free of birth and death. So how to get to that level, nice karma, how to get free of the modes of nature? We do it simply by surrendering to Krishna. We want to come to the stage of surrendering to Krishna. So Prabhupada continues saying, no one has to do anything more than render devotional service to the Lord. Yeah, if we just do devotional service, then the problem is solved. Of course, it, the problem is to get people to do devotional service. Prabhupada continues, he said, In the lower stages of life, one cannot immediately hope or adopt the activities of devotional service. The animals, for example they cannot immediately take up devotional service. Nor can one completely stop fruit of work. Fruit of work means we desire to enjoy the results of our work. We can, that's also not an easy thing to give up. Everyone works to enjoy the fruit. But devotional service means to give up the fruit. So to get people to come to that level of devotional service is a, it's not so easy. We are conditioned souls, Prabhupada continues, how we work for sense gratification. We have our own selfish interest. An ordinary person works for his own enjoyment. But this principle of sense enjoyment when this principle of sense enjoyment is extended to include his society, nation, humanity in general, then it assumes various attractive names. <laughs> Prabhupada is fond of naming all these things, and he talks about altruism, socialism, communism, nationalism, humanitarianism and we call it these isms are attractive forms of karma bandana people are thinking they're doing some good when they do this kind of work but Srila Prabhupada identifies this kind of work as simply bondage to the material world you do some good for people materially it's not going to help your spiritual life. You're not helping their spiritual life, and you're not helping your own spiritual life. You do what you do some kind of things to help them materially. It's all bondage. So the Sri Shopanisha says that if one actually wants to live for any of the above isms, then he has to make them God-centered. And Prabhupada gives an example about God-centered. He says, just, there's no harm in being a family man. If you're in God-consciousness, if you have a God-centered home, a God-centered family life. And the same way, 
other things like altruism, socialism, communism, nationalism, humanitarianism, they can all be done provided you have that isavasya spirit, that mood that God is in the center, that everything is his and it's for his pleasure. So that is required. So this is, this is the message here in this mantra of Sri Shopanishad. Prabhupada continues, he says, Lord Krishna states that God-centered activities are so valuable that just a few of them can save a person from the greatest danger. Of course, the danger is that we're in the human form of life and we're going to lose it and we will fall into the lower species. So that, that will be very unfortunate. We don't want that to happen. A foolish man can't, foolish people, they don't see this happening. They're so attached to their sense gratification. They don't see how they're going to fall into the lower species of life. So the, the Ishopanishad is, in, this big, big, in these first three mantras, the Ishopanishad is encouraging us to come to this spirit of Isavashya. Isha meaning the Lord, and Avashya with the Lord in the center of all activities. In other words, everything is done for his pleasure. So, being so engaged, we may wish to live for many, many years. Otherwise, long life has no value. And then Prabhupada says, a tree can live a long, but there's no point in living like trees. And then Prabhupada quotes some other examples which are given in the uh, second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the I think it's chapter number three or chapter number two where uh, Sona Karishi is giving different examples. He's talking about this is a long life like a tree or breathing like bellows. So the bellows also produce air. So you may say, no, I'm, I'm breathing, but you're breathing and without God consciousness, then it's just like the bellows which produce air. Or, another example, beget children like the hogs and the dogs. Well, the hogs and the dogs are very expert. They have big litters. When, they're, when they produce offspring, they'll produce six or eight offspring at a time. So, uh, you want to simp simply do like that? Well, that's the business of the hogs and the dogs. And you want to eat, you may eat like camels. The camels, they eat thorns and taste their own blood and they think they're enjoying. So this kind of ignorance, this is, is that what you want? We're not encouraged in that way. Excuse me. Okay, so Almighty God and um, um, a, a humble, God-centered life is more valuable than a colossal hoax of a life dedicated to godless altruism or socialism. So altruism or socialism simply concerned with the material bodies. They're not doing any spiritual benefit for anyone. So Prabhupada says, that's, it's just a hoax. People want to put on a show, they think they're doing good. But they're not doing any good for anyone. They're not doing any good for themselves or for other people. Because whatever benefit they give them is very temporary. And it's going to be finished with the body.
So Prabhupada continues, when altruism, act, altruistic activities are executed in the, in the spirit of Ishopanishad, in other words as Ishavasha, then they become a form of karma yoga. And such activities are recommended in the Bhagavad Gita. They guarantee people promotion from the danger of falling into the lower species. So even though such God-centered activities may not be completed, they're still good for the person because they will guarantee him a human form in his next birth. You're guaranteed because you've made some endeavor for Krishna consciousness. You made some endeavor to do devotional service. So Prabhupada, in this way you can have another chance to improve our position in the path of liberation. How can, how, how one can execute God-centered activities is elaborately explained in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Srila Rupa Goswami. So Prabhupada has given us this book also. And so it's recommended we read this also part of the Bhakti Shastri course. The first, uh, the first section of the nectar of Bhakti of the nectar of devotion. So it's recommended to read that book. And Prabhupada said, anybody who is who's interested in performing these their activities in the spirit of Sri Shopanishad in this Ishavasha Center, then they should read this book. They should read the nectar of devotion. So of course you're going to study that nectar of devotion, that part of the Bhakti Shastri course. Okay, are there any questions on Mantra 2? I don't think there's anything very difficult there. Anyone has any question before we go on to Mantra 3? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, can I ask you a question? Are you in the class? Yes, uh, Guru Dev. Uh, uh, Prabhupada said that uh, uh, we have uh, some Oh, sorry. So we have a. Oh, sorry, I found my question. Huh? Sorry, I found my question. Ah, Prabhupada said we have a, a positive activity. So, yeah. Guru, Maharaj, Guru Maharaj, maybe I can ask a question about the previous, uh, the, uh, previous lecture. What? Yes, you quoted the uh, verse from Bhagavad Gita from the uh, sixth chapter, uh, text number uh, 41, uh, that um, un unsuccessful yogi is born in a family of uh, 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 righteous people or in... Uh, 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 aristocracy family. So what uh, in Prabhupada said that aristocracy means uh, merchant family. So why uh, this is not Kshatriya family for them or as unsuccessful yogi? Well, Bhagavad Gita just says they will be born in a wealthy family. It may be Kshatriya, it may be Vaishya. They'll take, birth, they'll take birth in a wealthy family or an aristocratic family mm. so that they, they can again have the opportunity to continue their devotional service. Mm -hmm. Yes, Guru Mahalat, thank you. Okay, any other question from anybody else? Okay, then we'll go on to Mantra 3. 
mantra number three. Asurya namate loka andena tamasavrita tamste pratyapigyajanti ekachatmahano jana. The killer of the soul, whoever he may be, must enter into the planets known as the worlds of the faithless, full of darkness and ignorance. So, the interesting word here in this verse, it's mentioned, Atmaha, right? Atmaha, the killer of the soul. Atmahana, uh, Atmahana, the killer of the soul. So people will question, how is it possible the soul can be killed? Is this not a contradiction? Because from the Bhagavad Gita, we have heard Ajopisan Avyayatma, that for the soul, there is no birth and there is no death. But here it's saying Atmahana, the killer of the soul. So we want to understand this contradiction. Actually, there's no contradiction. But what is being said is that if somebody acts in an impious, irreligious manner, then he will enter into, he's like, he's like somebody killing the soul. Because the nature of the soul is to be a servant of the Lord. The soul by nature, by its constitution, is a servant of the Lord. But those people who are demoniac, they will not like to do service for the Lord. They would like to kill the nature of the soul. And so these people are being described. If people are godless, then they will enter into the planets known as the worlds of the faithless, full of darkness and ignorance. So we know people often have to go to work in these kind of conditions, darkness, Six months of winter, never see the sun for six months, and then six months of summer. So, this is a continuation from Mantra 2. Mantra 2 described those people who live in God consciousness, who live in the Ishavasya spirit. And now Mantra 3 is describing those people who don't live in that Ishavasha spirit. They don't care about having God in the center. They want to get rid of God. So what happens to these people? They are described here as Atmahana, killers of the soul. And they enter into the planets known as the worlds of the faithless, full of darkness and ignorance. So Srila Prabhupada describes for us, human life is disting distinguished from animal life. You can see Prabhupada is giving us the very basic philosophy here, the distinction between human life and the animal life. So the animals, they're engaged in four activities, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. In Sanskrit, the words are Atyaha Ahara Nidra Baya Maitunati. So, animal life is based on these four activities. Human life is meant to be different. Human life is meant to have some responsibility added in there. Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending are done, but they are minimized. 
the materialistic people, they want to maximize these things. They want more sex, more sleep, more food, more drink. Like that, they think that is the success of life. But those people with more knowledge, they will want to control these things and regulate these activities and minimize them. So that that is uh, that should be understood. The animals they're only thinking, where is food? Where is sleep? Where is sex? But human beings are not meant to just think about that. Human beings have a greater responsibility. So Prabhupada explains, those people who recognize that they have a responsibility, they are called suras or godly persons. And those who are neglectful of these responsibilities, they are called asuras or demons. Even though they may have a nice, what seems like a nice birth, and they have a nice nature, gentle people, but still they can be demons if they do not recognize the soul and the need of the soul. So Prabhupada continues, he said, throughout the universe, there are only these two types of human beings. Right? You have the godly and the ungodly. So, The, the godly people, they're meant to work. They're meant to work for the pleasure of the Lord. So Prabhupada quotes the Rig Vedas. It says in the Rig Vedas that the godly people, they aim at the lotus feet of the Lord and they act accordingly. Their ways are as illuminated as the path of the sun. So the godly people will behave in the proper manner according to the rules and regulations of scripture. Intelligent human beings, Prabhupada continues, must remember that the soul obtains a human be a human form after evolving through millions of years in the cycle of birth and death, transmigration. The material world is compared to an ocean and the human body is compared to a boat. So here Prabhupada is giving a very important example. Everyone should not hear this analogy which is given. He said, the material world is compared to an ocean and the human body is like the boat right so the boat has to cross the ocean and the vedic scriptures describe that there are teachers who are called acharyas acharya is not only a teacher well he will give he will set the example for others by his behavior he will not only uh, not only behave properly but he will also teach so a child they're described here uh, The acharyas are compared to the boatman or if you like the captain of the ship. Sometimes the spiritual teacher is also there. So the, the Vedic scriptures and the acharyas or saintly teachers are compared to expert boatmen. So some people will follow the scriptures and other people, they will listen to the acharyas and they will take the message from the acharyas. 
And in this way they can go on and they can uh, make their own ashram and they can give shelter to people. So the human body is, uh, the human body is also mentioned. The human body is compared to the favorable breezes that help the boat to cross the ocean, to reach its destination. So it's, it's a nice example. The material world is the ocean, the human body is the boat. And then the Vedic scriptures and the Acharyas are the boatman. And the facilities of the human body, they're compared to the breezes, the good breezes which come off from the ocean, which is just at the side of Dwarka, where Lord Krishna was residing. So, the human body is compared to the breezes which help to cross that ocean of material existence. So, with all, a Prabhupada said, if we have all these facilities, if a human being does not use them for self-realization, then he is very unfortunate. And he, Prabhupada said, he should be considered Atmaha, a killer of the soul. So this, this is what, how Prabhupada judges, if you're not willing to uh, use the human body properly in the service of the Lord, to use the facilities like the scriptures and so on, then you're Atmaha, you're like a killer of the soul. So we don't want to do that. So Sri Shopanish said once, in clear terms, the killer of the soul is destined to enter into the darkest region of ignorance. So nobody wants to do that. You don't, we don't want to go into the darkest region of ignorance. You go into the darkest region of ignorance to suffer perpetually, it means endlessly. So nobody wants that kind of existence. Then Prabhupada continues, he said, there are swine, dogs, camels, asses, etc. So Prabhupada's mentioning different animals. He said, their economic necessities, their economic needs are just as important to them as ours are to us. But the economic problems of these animals are stressed only under nasty and unpleasant conditions. Yeah, we want to, <laughs> we want to transcend, of course it's good, it's good devotees are able to transcend the material conditions and not to get too much disturbed by the material conditions. Ultimately we have to depend on Lord Krishna for everything. So Prabhupada said the animals are just as important. The human being has a comfortable life compared to the animals. Why? Because the human life is more important. The human being, he can perform rituals and activities. He can offer, for example, incense, offer the lamp, butter to the Lord. All the facilities are given by the grace of Krishna.
So Prabhupada gives another another example here in this purport. He talks about a man. One man is given a better life than that of the animals because because he's a human being. He has a greater responsibility. Just like yesterday, we gave the example. Oh, I was giving class yesterday, not this class, but we had a class and we were giving the example that the highly placed government worker enjoys better facilities than the ordinary person. And the person who is highly placed, he wants to enjoy and he likes to come and enjoy with the other workers who are not blessed with his position. So human life is very special. We get facilities, we get nice opportunities for devotional service. But Prabhupada notes, he said, the modern soul, the, the, the modern society, Prabhupada calls it a soul-killing civilization and has only increased the problems of the hungry stomach. So there are many different problems in the world today and we haven't helped the world, we haven't solved any of the problems of the world by our tiny efforts. We've only increased the problems. People are more hungry than ever. They want prasadam. So Prabhupada talks about polished men. Polished men. When we approach a polished animal, animals, they're simply interested in their sense gratification. And if we're only thinking of sense gratification, then we're no better than them. So the modern souls killing civilizations only increase the problems of the hungry stomach. Prabhupada gives an example. When we approach we approach a polished animal in the form of a modern civilized man and ask him to take interest in self-realization. He will say that he simply wants to work. He will say that he simply wants to work. And why he wants to work? To satisfy his needs, his stomach, his concern for that. He simply wants to work to fill his stomach and there is no need of self-realization. So this is the ignorance of the modern man. People are so cruel. He's working hard to fill, his, to fill his stomach, but at the same time, he's always threatened with unemployment. Those people who have a job, they are fortunate people. But other, there are many other people who have no job. They cannot keep a job. There's nothing for them to do. So this is the problem. You have the modern society, it simply created unemployment.
Prabhupada continues speaking more about the value of human life. He said, we're not, we're not meant to live like the hogs and dogs, just for sense gratification. If we do not care for self-realization, the laws of nature force us to work very hard. If we don't try for self-realization, we're put under the laws of karma. And the laws of karma force us to work. Force us to work like animals, like hogs and dogs. Prabhupada talks about how pull, people have to pull carts. And then Prabhupada said, some some of the regions where the so, where the asuras are sent to work are revealed in this mantra. Some of the re, they're described full of darkness and ignorance. So that's a description of some of the places where people have to go to work. So if a man fails to discharge his duties as a human being, then he is forced to transmigrate to the Asura planet and there take birth in degraded species of life. So that's the result when people don't follow in the Ishavasha spirit. Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that a man who enters upon the path of self-realization but does not complete the process despite having sincerely tried to realize his relationship with God is given a chance to appear in a family of Suchi and Srimat. So here comes, this is the question which we were asked just a little while ago. Yuvati Sachi was asking about this situation, how some souls, they enjoy and some souls suffer. So here it is described how a yogi was not successful, so he, he gets a chance to go on to take birth he'll take a birth in the material world and then he can take it he going after the mother takes one birth then his, the mother will take they will take take they will each do their activities so suchi and sriman the the soul will take birth either in a, a spiritually advanced family like a brahmana or he would take birth in a, in a, in a good-looking family, a wealthy family. And in this way they can enjoy, they can enjoy their material facilities. And Prabhupada talks about, he says, uh, he, he may take birth in a, a mer mercantile family a mer or a mercantile community. So that's, that's a good birth, but it's the fate of the unsuccessful yogi. Those who were a bit more successful they would take birth in the family of a devotee. They still have to take birth because they're still not perfect. But they would take birth in the family of someone who is a devotee. And then he can take birth again.
So a person who fails to achieve self-realization is given a chance, a better chance in his next life due to his sincere efforts in this life. If even a fallen candidate is given a chance to take such birth in a respectable and noble family, one can hardly imagine the status of one who has achieved success. By simply attempting to realize God, one is guaranteed birth in a wealthy or aristocratic family. But, but those who do not ever make an attempt they don't even make an attempt, what will happen to them? They, they want to be covered by illusion and they're too materialistic or too much they're too materialistic or they're too much in illusion too much attached Then, what will happen to them? Those who are too, they're not even making an attempt. They want to be covered by illusion. They're too materialistic, too much attached then they enter into the darker regions of the universe. The regions of where they're, regions where they're confined. They enter into the darkest regions, the lower regions of the universe. So such materialistic asuras make a show of religion, but their ultimate aim is material prosperity. The Bhagavad Gita rebukes such men, calling them Atmasambhavita, meaning that they are considered great only on the strength of deception and are empowered by the votes of the ignorant. And by their own material wealth, such asuras, devoid of self-realization and knowledge of Ishavashya are certain to enter into the darkest region. The conclusion is that a human being as human beings, we are not meant for simply solving economic problems or trying to solve all the problems of the material life into which we are being placed by the laws of nature. We're not meant for solving these problems. We're meant to get out of the material world. All right, so this is the third mantra. This is the, all on the section of proprietorship. So what happens to people who don't recognize the Lord as the proprietor? Then the wife will take birth again. She may come and like that, she may come in the womb of the mother and she can appear just like a goddess. So when Lord Krishna was born, 
Then there was also a goddess who appeared, Goddess Durga. And when Kansa tried to kill Dog Goddess Durga, she rose up in the air. <laughs> so Kansa was shocked and he had a change of heart at that time. Anyway, understand that there are such things as demons. There are demons and there are, there are people. There are dev devas and asuras. The devas cooperate with the plan of the Lord and the asuras don't. The asuras, they, they have their own ways. They have their own devices. All right, so that's mantra three, the killer of the soul. We'll go on to mantra four. Anijaya dekam manaso jivyo naina deva apno vam purvamarsat tadyavato nana te titistat tasmina po matarishva dadadati. All right, translation. Although fixed in his abode, the personality of Godhead is swifter than the mind and can overcome all others running. The powerful demigods cannot approach him. Although in one place, he controls those who supply the air and rain. He supplies on the, he supplies everything on the basis of his own authority, that he is the Supreme Lord and he can provide for everyone. So we're given some of the nice qualities here about the Lord. He's first of all, he's fixed in his abode. He has his own abode. What, what is his own abode? Goloka Vrindavan. What? Goloka Vrindavan Maharaj. Yes, his abode, Goloka Vrindavan, but can also be Vaikuntha. Right? He's fixed in his abode. It can be also Sweta Dweep. It can be where Lord Vishnu resides, the Kaushal Ocean. And so, so Goloka, of course, you can also say the Supreme Lord is there. So then it's described, he's swifter than the mind, how fast the mind can move. So the, the, the Lord is swifter than that. Within the mind, it takes a moment and we can think of the, we can think of the spiritual world, we can think of the causal ocean, we can think of Garbhodakashai Vishnu at the bottom of the universe, right? We can think of these things, but we don't really want to go there. But we hear about them. So the Lord is fixed in his abode and he can, he can overcome all others running. He doesn't, he, the, the Lord, can, uh, he doesn't have to take part in any races. He doesn't have to train but naturally he can overcome all obstacles. The powerful demigods cannot approach him. Well, he's the Supreme Lord, so even the demigods will have to respect the words of Lord Vishnu. Although he may, although in one place he controls those who supply the air and rain, he surpasses all in excellence. So this is the position of the Lord. There are so many demigods, 
but they're not able to approach him. Just like when Mother Bhumi was concerned about the planet because there were many demoniac kings on the face of the planet. So Mother Bhumi wanted to remove them. So what did she do? She First she went to Lord Brahma and she asked Lord Brahma to help. And Lord Brahma, he then went to the shore of the milk ocean and he meditated on Lord Vishnu. It was all done like that. It was all just done by meditation. The one who knows how to meditate. If you know the art of meditation, you can do these things. You can meditate on the Supreme Lord and he can communicate with you. But to approach him directly, we're not expected to do that. Even the demigods cannot approach him. So this verse is giving us practical information about the Supreme Lord. He's being described here. That he can only be known by his devotees. And his devotees can only know him by his mercy. You need the mercy of the Lord. It's not by our own efforts that we can know him. But he reveals himself to the devotees. When he's pleased by the devotees, then he will reveal himself to the devotees. So the mercy of the Lord is very important. And Prabhupada quotes Brahma Samhita. So the, the non-devotee, he can travel at the speed of the mind. He can travel millions of miles, but he cannot approach the lotus feet of Lord Govinda. So... Brahma Samhita also describes that the Lord has a transcendental body and he has, just as his body is transcendental, so the abode of the Lord is also transcendental and the Lord's abode is Goloka. And we are told the Lord's residence is there at Goloka and he is enjoying his pastimes eternally there in Goloka. And although the Lord resides in Goloka, he can, by his potencies, he can simultaneously reach every part of the universe. This is an important point to how the Lord can reach every part of the universe everywhere. There's nothing separate from it. Prabhupada gives an example from the Vishnu Purana. The Lord's energy are compared to heat and light, just like from a fire, there's heat and light. So although the fire is in one place, the heat and light can be distributed around the area. 
So similarly, the Lord, although he's in one place, his energies can be distributed everywhere. So Prabhupada then continues to discuss about the Lord's energies. And he said the Lord has many energies. But they are divided, there can be they can be understood that that there are three principal energies. And you have the marginal potency, the external potency, and the internal potency. In this way we understand the potency. So the demigods are empowered to control and to administrate natural phenomena. Things like Indra, he's the king of, he's in charge of the rain. And then you have another god, you have the sun god in charge of the, the rays of the light coming from the sun. And you have other different gods. You have the god of the water. You have the god of the. Uh, you have the god of. Learning, the goddess of learning. You have the goddess of wealth. You have the god of the sea. You have so many different controllers, all different aspects of the material nature, which are all given to us by the Lord. They're all under the control of the different demigods. And the different demigods, they're all under the control of the Supreme Lord. So the material world is the Lord's creation. It's his external potency. And the spiritual world, that is the internal potency. So Prabhupada explains the spiritual world is where the kingdom of God is situated. We want to go to the spiritual world. We want to enter into the kingdom of God first here in this world. And we can adapt ourselves to the kingdom of God in this world. And then we can go on to become qualified to enter into the kingdom of God in the spiritual world. But we have to train up ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves, first of all, in this life. So the different energies of the Lord are present everywhere. The Lord and his energies are non-different. We should not mistake these energies. We should not mistake these energies for the supreme truth. Nor should, the, nor should we, we wrongly consider that the supreme Lord is therefore distributed everywhere. Some people may think like that, that the Lord has lost his personality because he's taken some form, he's taken some potency. Or, so we may think that so the Lord loses his personality. That cannot be. <laughs> the Lord has potencies. These potencies are eternal. Of course, potencies can be transformed. They can be transformed. They can be used in different situations. There are different energies present everywhere. 
but the Lord is the supreme truth. Now, there's the Lord and the Lord's energy. Prabhupada said they're not different, but at the same time they are different. The Supreme Lord is distributed everywhere impersonally. Impersonally he's there in the form of the Brahma Jyoti. So some people may think that the Lord loses his personal identity and merges into the oneness, but we don't accept that in our path of devotion. People only understand things according to their limited brain substance. try to understand things with our limited mind and senses, then it will be difficult for us. We have to understand everything on the basis of scripture. So we're warned here in this verse that no one can approach the Lord by his own limited potency. You want to meet with the Lord? You have to qualify, you have to be patient, and you have to wait for the mercy of the Lord. It's not that we can push our way in, as some people do. So then Srila Prabhupada takes up the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, text number 2, where Krishna is speaking about Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam, Pavitram, Idam Utamam, Pragyak Shavagamam Dharmyam, Susukam Kartam Avyayam. So, in that verse, Lord Krishna is describing more about his own personality and the process of devotional service. He says in that verse that not even the great sages and rishis can know him. And so what hope is there of people like the asuras knowing him? Of course the asuras can also be great devotees. We know Prahlad Maharaj is born in the family of asuras and and then the grandson, Dhruva Mahara, uh, not Dhruva Loka, but we cannot know the Lord just simply by our own limited senses. We need his own mercy to reveal himself to us. So Prabhupada writes, this fourth mantra of Sri Ishopanishad very clearly suggests that the absolute truth is ultimately the absolute person. Otherwise there would have been no need to mention so many details in support of his personal features. the personal features of the Lord, understanding how the Lord is a person. Of course, we have nowadays people take so many pictures of themselves and of their friends and of their seniors. And they like people like to take big photos. It's going on everywhere. How people become so addicted to having photographs made and taking pictures. So we have to we have to take picture in the mind within the mind we want to have a picture of Lord Krishna. We want to fix our mind on Lord Krishna. 
and th then we can remember him in every situation. So the, the absolute truth is described here to help us to understand that God is a person, that he is not just simply energy. Certainly he has energy, but at the same time he is a person and he has a transcendental body. And with his transcendental body he performs many transcendental activities. And he, with that tra same transcendental body he was there at the battle of Kurukshetra and before the battle he spoke the Bhagavad Gita, he spoke the battle of Kurukshetra in the form of Kasi. Okay, the individual parts and parcels of the Lord have all the symptoms of the Lord himself. They have limited sphere of activity and are therefore all limited. So the difference between the Lord and the living entity is described. First of all, what is the the, the points of the point of similarity that the living entity has all the symptoms of the Lord, symptoms of the Lord, the different characteristics of the, the material body uh, are certainly not there in the Lord's body. But the, the symptoms of the Lord, for example, how the Lord gives pleasure to his devotees and how he kills the demons, how he deals with the universal affairs. He takes care of any problems, of any uh, breakdown which takes place in the universe. And he will take part in the universe himself. So Krishna comes as a person. And still people will say, ultimately there's no person. You see, people, conditioned souls, they're thinking that if you're a person, then you cannot be perfect. They cannot understand, they seem to have difficulty to understand that there's a transcendental person with a spiritual body. And with your transcendental body, you can get out the modes of nature. So we have the symptoms. We can, we, we move, we walk, we talk, we dance, we, we like to do things. We want to connect all of our activities to Krishna, do things for Krishna, not for our own sense gratification but for Krishna. Okay. The individual parts and parcels have all the symptoms, but limited spheres of activities. Krishna can do everything with all of his senses. Any, the senses are interchangeable. We can do some things, but we cannot equal Krishna. The parts and parcels are never equal to the whole. They cannot appreciate the Lord's full potency. 
under the influence of material nature, foolish and ignorant living beings who are but parts and parcels of the Lord try to communicate, try, try to conjecture about the Lord's transcendental position. They try to understand by their mind the transcendental position of the Lord. So that is, will be hopeless. You'll never be able to do that with the power of your own mind and senses. So Ishopanishad warns us of the futility of trying to establish the identity of the Lord through mental speculation. Don't try to understand Krishna by the power of your own mind and senses. In other words, we have to hear about Krishna from the revealed scriptures. Try to learn of the transcendence from Krishna himself. The, 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 the knower of the Vedas, the Lord alone has full knowledge of his transcendence. So we want to understand Krishna. The best way to understand about Krishna is by hearing about Krishna from himself. Just like we want to know about someone, they know themselves better. A person knows himself better than other people. We have to hear about Krishna from himself. And therefore, Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita. Scriptures are there to guide us, to help us, to understand him. Every part and parcel of the whole is endowed with some particular energy to act according to the Lord's will. When the part and parcel living entity forgets his activities under the Lord's will, then He is considered to be in Maya, illusion. When we forget that we're part and parcel of the Lord, then we're in Maya. So the Ishopanishad is warning us to be very careful to play the part given to us by Krishna. This does not mean that the individual soul should not use his own initiative. But we should be careful how you use that initiative. We should use it in the service of the Lord. Because we are part and parcel of the Lord, we must partake. We have the same initiative of the Lord as well. And when a person uses his initiative or active nature with intelligence, understanding that everything is the Lord's potency, then he can revive his original consciousness, which was lost due to association with Maya, the external energy. So the Lord... Uh, the Lord's position is being described in relation to the living entities. The Lord is supreme and he has his own initiative. He can do anything and everything. However, the living entity, as living entities, we are his parts and parcels. And we can also do things, but what we, whatever we do, it's going to be limited. It's not going to be done with the same kind of intelligence as the Supreme Lord. We have some intelligence, but again, our intelligence will be limited. 
So we have to appreciate the supreme position of the Lord. <laughs> Prabhupada concludes his purport by saying, all power is obtained from the Lord. Therefore, each particular power must be utilized to execute the will of the Lord and not otherwise. The Lord can be known by one who has adopted such a submissive service attitude. So Krishna can give unlimited power to the living entities that they can do wonderful things. We see, for example, Hanuman in his service to Lord Rama, how Hanuman could jump across the ocean to find out Sita, and how Hanuman could bring the, the top of the mountain to bring the herbs for the... to. Uh, revive Lakshman, Hanuman could, could do so many incredible services. He was the, the messenger for Lord Ramachandra and he was always there to serve Lord Ramachandra whenever there was any problem. He was always eager to take up service. So Hanuman got his power by the grace of the Lord. It all came by the grace of the Lord. And so the Lord is known by one who has adopted such submissive service attitude. So that mood of being the servant and willing to do what the Lord wants, that is very important. Just to surrender, just like Prabhupada got the order from the Lord that he had to go to the West. And Prabhupada knew it was going to be very difficult, but he had to do it. So he did it. The Lord helped him. God helps those who help themselves. If you want to help yourself, surrender to Krishna. Perfect knowledge means knowing the Lord in all his features, knowing his potencies and knowing how these potencies work by his will. These matters are described in the Bhagavad Gita, the essence of all the Upanishads. So pure knowledge means to know Krishna in his all of his features and know about his potencies and how they work. How can we know all of these things? We have to hear. We have to hear the scriptures. The scriptures are there to describe the glories of the Lord. So we have to hear. We have to read ourselves, And in this way we can go on to understand everything by the grace of the Lord. All right, are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj Sridham here. Yeah. Maharaj, uh, let's say we are devotee, okay, while our leaving the body, okay, whether we have to remember, uh, let's say I'm a Krishna Bhakta example, sorry, I'm a Narasimha Bhakta. I always praying only Narasimha, my desire more to pray Narasimha example. That means that can consider as a complete Maharaj layer while you leaving the body, you remember only Narasimha, then you will go to the Bologa Vrindavan, either you will go to the head of our Lord Narasimha, Narasimha Dev. Is there Maharaj? Is it? There's any different Maharaj? Either as a devotee, we should only focus our, our prayers more to like a Radha Krishna deities like that Maharaj? Well, 
Prabhupada, if you know, are, are you worshipping Radha and Krishna? No, Maharaj, I am worshipping Yana Bhadi Subramai and uh, Narsimhadi. You're worshipping Nishingadev and who else? Yes, Maharaj, in the house. No, but who else besides Nishingadev? Yana Bhadi Subramai. Ganapati? No, no, Jagannath, Jagannath, Maharaj, Jagannath Bhadi Subramai. Oh, Jagannath Bhadi Subramai, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why Maharaj, I'm asking whether uh, we as a devotee, our focus should be within like this is fine, Maharaj. That means we still achieve the Golga Vrindavan. Either if, let's say we we pray always Narshinga, example, our our desire more to uh, pray Narshinga, then what our destiny will be, Maharaj? Whether it's the same benefit we'll get, either different will be slightly whatever. Well, Lord Nishringa Dev, if we're praying more to Lord Nishringa Dev, if our consciousness is more towards Nishringa Dev, yeah. that's Vaikuntha, right? Lord Nishringa Dev, you know, you, that's not the mood of Goloka. Okay. If, what, if, if you want to go to Goloka, we have to cultivate that mood of the bridge Basi people, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a special, and you, well, well, Rupa Goswami describes also in Nectar of Instruction what you have to do if you want to go to uh, Goloka, you know, uh, Nectar of Instruction said you have to go and live in Vrindavan and you have to <laughs> chant the holy name constantly. You know, you have to develop that kind of, this, that kind of consciousness. It's uh, it's very specialized to go to Goloka, but if you want, if you don't mind, and you know, Vaikuntha is also the spiritual world. You know, mm. you, the, you know, going to Goloka that's a very a very special thing there. Goloka, the mood of Goloka with the cowherd people and and the mood of Vrindavan. But you can, we, you certainly could go to Vaikuntha, worshipping mm. Lord, Lord Nishringa Dev. And that's also very glorious, you know, that's also the spiritual world. Sometimes, the, the, worshipping Radha and Krishna Yes, if you worship Radha and Krishna, then of course that's cultivating the mood of Goloka. Okay. Right, yeah. The gopis, they worship Radha and Krishna and they meditate on Radha and Krishna. They remember the pastimes of Radha and Krishna. So, you can, you can go to Worship of Radha and Krishna, that will help you certainly to go to Goloka. Mm -hmm. if, that, if that's really where you want to go, but if if your devotion is more towards N Lord Nishinga Dev, then you can also go to him. You can go to Vaikuntha. Goloka is the mood of the, you know, the British Basic people. And you have to go and live in Vrindavan. <laughs> you should, and if you can't go and live in Vrindavan, at least mentally you should live in Vrindavan. You see, within your mind you should live in Vrindavan. Be thinking always of Vrindavan. It's not just not always necessary you have to go there of course many of us we cannot we're not able to go there but within the mind we can be thinking of Vrindavan and if within the mind you're thinking of Vrindavan and you're thinking of Krishna and you're remembering Krishna's pastimes then that will certainly carry you help you to get, get to Goloka Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes. 
you have any doubt about that? You have any further question? Oh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Ask you a question, Maharaj. Maharaj, this is from the previous verse, number three, where Sila Prabhupada says that we are giving this human form of life not to, not to work hard like animals. Uh, and then some comments are there also that the, 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 the laws of nature focus, uh, force us also to work very hard uh, even uh, through we may not want to do so. So I want to know what is actually uh, in terms of working hard or working, you know, uh, the, the difference between devotees and non-devotees. Uh, because, uh, you know, most devotees are from congregation and they also have, have to work, you know, <laughs> to have the duties of the family, to work, to maintain their family, to eat, to medicine, etc. So, of course, uh, devotees will practice Krishna consciousness and uh, means will work towards self-realization. That is the big difference of devotees. But in terms of working, it's actually almost the same with the karmas, or they have any difference in terms of uh, material working or, or, or duties? Yes, well... As devotees, of course, you have to work. Yeah, or you know, many of you say, as you say, most many of our congregation devotees they have jobs, they're working to maintain themselves, and you have to work hard. Many people that, that I know, like computer programmers, they often have to work long hours. They have to sit there for long hours doing their programming. It's not easy. Uh, the, but we we should be concerned. We 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 should try to optimize this uh, work. You know, you don't want to just be working all day and all, all the time that you have no time for spiritual practice. You have to, there has to be some arrangement so that we get the chance, we get, we get some time for association with devotees. If all the time just working, then it's not very good. It's not very good. It's not healthy for our spiritual life. If all the time you're just working, just like sometimes I know one couple, you know, in, in China, they, they have two children and the husband's working all day and he comes home at night, he goes out to work again at night, driving the taxi. You know, it's, it's difficult. It, it's very difficult because the pressure just to meet the expenses of living in the world, what's required to have, to have a family, to bring up the children. So devotees have to put a lot of energy and work and effort into uh, their work to keep their jobs and to be successful in their work. A lot of effort is required makes it difficult for them to also have a balance with their spiritual life. But still, devotees, somehow they manage, you know, I know some families, you know, they have, they're working hard and they, they have their children and, and they have their spiritual life also. They do preaching, somehow they manage. They get, they make time, so they're careful not to waste their time. If we see material world, you know, people, they can waste a lot of time. Sit, watch television for hours. You know, they come, just come home from work and they just watch television all the time. Watch movies sometimes for hours. 
and people so people can they they do waste a lot of time so but devotees those people who are devotees they'll be more cautious to use their time properly using it for the practical activities so that they have time so that they can get some time for the balance for the other work for their devotional life as well as their ordinary work and of course devotees also work hard some people are full-time devotees they work hard <coughs> it's, it's not easy being a full-time devotee you know full-time devotees can also work very hard and often brahmacharis for example they're not given any salary they're working hard to keep themselves busy all day all the time in the service of krishna but that that is the work of love when you work for krishna you, there's real love people uh, they take satisfaction in that work in the material world people are working but they don't really they, they don't experience that same bliss that same pleasure which is there in serving krishna there's a special pleasure and satisfaction which comes in working for krishna you can work for some big company multinational company or you can be a teacher or you can work in for the government and so on but you don't feel the same kind of pleasure there's there's this is the, the rasa the pl the bliss which comes in service to krishna is not there in any other work so devotees take great pleasure in working for krishna Hmm. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you, Krishna Guru Maharaj. I have a question, two questions. So, the first one. <clears throat> we are not uh, at the stage of the pure devotion now. And in this mantra, uh, it is described that the Lord has um, some um, very interesting qualities so he is in his boat always and <clears throat> at the same time uh, he is faster than uh, other runnings uh, he can move uh, uh, he can move like this so uh, should we try to understand the contradictory uh, contradictory qualities of the lord or should we uh, just read and hear about these qualities uh, and uh, uh, without uh, trying to understand them well of course you have to first hear about them and you do have to try to understand them otherwise what's the point of hearing if you're not understanding what's the point of hearing about them yes you do want to hear about them and you want to understand them also we want to understand according to our limited brain capacity we try to understand just like we hear that Lord Krishna has inconceivable potencies. So how can we understand inconceivable? It's beyond our comprehension. <laughs> so, well, what, at least we can understand that he has such powers which cannot be understood by our mind and senses. We, we cannot understand much of what is inconceivable, but we can understand that, certainly we can understand that it is inconceivable, that he does have some inconceivable potencies. And then Lord Krishna also says, to those who are constantly devoted, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. Out of compassion, I, dwelling in their heart, destroy the darkness born of ignorance with the lamp of knowledge. So Lord Krishna in the heart acts on us to help us to understand. The more 
the, we desire to understand, the more we really desire, then the Lord will give us that understanding. Just like Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur was meditating on that, the final, on the Gayatri Mantra. He was he was meditating on the Gayatri Mantra, how it's a twenty four and a half syllables, and he could only find, he could only count twenty four syllables, and he he was in so much he was just so anxious to understand what happened to the other half a syllable, where did it go, and he was meditating. How could, where is the other half of the syllable? He was thinking about it, he was thinking about it, and he got so desperate, he was thinking, he was, he was ready to give up his life if he could not understand how there was 24 and a half syllables. And at that time, then the Lord revealed to him. The Lord spoke to him and revealed some, a truth to him, how there was another half a syllable mantra there. So that's one example how the Lord helps the devotee to understand that Krishna in the heart is a Chaitra Guru can help you to understand. The other way we try to understand also is that with the help of Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. We want to understand things, hear the Shastras more, read again and again and gradually we'll start to understand. We'll hear from the Shastras, and we, we associate with the, the, the sadhus, with the saintly devotees, and with the Guru, then everything can be revealed. Yes? What is your other question? Yes, a little bit like I found this Prabhupada supportive from the uh, for what to second mantra. So, uh, when he realizes the authority of the personality of God, it was Sudeva or Krishna, uh, <clears throat> uh, is it, uh, it is uh, to be understood that he has attained the stage of the positive knowledge. And then Prabhupada explained what does it mean, positive knowledge. So, I guess that uh, there is negative knowledge also. And uh, would you please explain what does it mean for us negative knowledge? Is it a material knowledge or impersonal knowledge or maybe something else? Well, positive knowledge would be knowledge about the, the Lord directly in relation to the Lord, which is pleasing and satisfying to the devotee, to the heart of the devotee. Positive knowledge is given for us in the Bhagavad Gita. that we can understand the Lord with the help of positive knowledge. Uh, it's there, it, it's, this is in text number four, right? Text number four, mantra four. Guru Dev mantra two, in the form of mantra two. Oh, mantra two. Hmm? Really? This is the third, uh, third uh, paragraph. The third paragraph. The third paragraph, in the end of paragraph. Huh? In the end of this paragraph. I, I don't I don't see it in the third paragraph. Oh, 
Гурудев, but uh, is, yes, yes, this one. Uh -huh. huh? Yes, yes, this one, this body, I mean. What does the paragraph begin? Well, the instructions of Shri Shapanishat are more elaborately explained in the book. Okay, and, and then where is it mentioned about, again, positive knowledge? Okay, I see it now, okay. It is to be understood that he has attained the stage of positive knowledge in the purified stage. In the pure positive knowledge. In this purified stage, the modes of nature don't exist. All right. So, we're given some examples, positive knowledge. He realizes the authority of the absolute, of the personality of Godhead. Right? He realizes the authority of the personality of Godhead. In other words, that Krishna is the supreme truth and everything he is saying is absolute truth. Lord Krishna is the ultimate overseer. He is the controller of everything. He is the authority. Nothing happens without his sanction. So that is positive knowledge. And what is negative knowledge? Well, negative knowledge would be that you don't understand. You, you, you think everything is just happening without a controller. It would be like the demonic. The demons think, they think there is no controller, there is no God in charge. That would be negative knowledge. But absolute knowledge is to accept the authority. So negative knowledge is you don't accept the authority. You understand? Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you very much. It's clear now. So, please accept my business. Okay. Any other question? Okay, we will stop here tonight. So, we'll go on next class. Mantra number five. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki. Thank you, 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 Thank you,